So I'm going to put that question. Why are you here? Because there's nothing better to do on Christmas Eve. All right. Is that right? Yeah. I like your honesty. You know? No, this, it's interesting to think why are people coming here? And why did you choose this topic on this day? I think the topic is Jesus, isn't it? Okay. Just making sure I'm in the right place. <laughs> um, because a lot of people would be saying that, oh, that's a bid. They're going to celebrate Christmas at Jalas, Shah Jalal Mosque. And then other people are going to be saying, no, no, it's very important. We need to address. I'm like, why? Anyone want to help me? You can help me to kind of know what I've been talking about. If you can tell me why I'm here. Why are you here? Why do you want to know about Jesus today? Please, thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. All right, so you're looking for an Aqidah class. I better put my thobe on a bit more straight. Because <laughs> if that's what you're looking for, then that's, that is something, that's something very specific. And I like that answer. So, are you all coming for an Aqidah class? Because I'm certainly wouldn't be ask, asking all these little kids to be coming. And how are you doing? Okay? Yeah, you. And you. <laughs> huh? Is that why you've invited these kids along? No, he's shaking his head. <clears throat> You know, he's done four years of Aqidah. He's not coming here. Why are you here? You're here to listen to stories. Good. Right. I'm going to tell three stories at the same time. Because the story of Jesus is important at lots of different levels. Many different levels. And the three stories I'm going to tell are the story of Sayyidina Isa, the story of Jesus, which is in the Quran. But I'm also going to tell briefly the story of Ja'far, Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And I'm also going to tell you a little story or two about some dude from Nottingham uh, called Abdulaziz. Because he grew up not with the correct aqidah. He didn't know about Jesus. He knew about Santa Claus and he knew something about the nativity with, with some angel there and some presence of frankincense and myrrh and a couple of camels here and there but alhamdulillah I learnt something I start with that story because many many years later that kid that grew up in Nottingham made friends with one of the biggest enemies of the Muslims um, and I say made friends because I took a lot of criticism for keeping company with a complete fascist who was quite openly attacking Islam. And my first experience with him, he came into a class which was a bit like this, of kind of new Muslimy kind of Muslimy kind of talk about Islam, general kind of talk. But he came to attack Islam. And he came in very aggressive and he attacked me and he attacked me and he attacked me. And he attacked Islam and he attacked Islam. And every time he said something, I answered him as best I could with the best manners I possibly could. Till eventually he got really angry and just said, You ain't a proper Muslim anyway! I says, I'm trying my best. And then he realized how stupid he was. Because he came here to attack me and attack Islam. And he didn't get what he wanted. So then he smiled and he says, Should we start? I said, Look, should we start this again? And he was known to be a real enemy of the Muslims. And over the next 10 years, we stayed in contact. He used to come to my classes regularly. He visited me twice in Scotland. He wrote a book against Islam, and he wrote a book which was less against Islam. And eventually, about three years ago, we met in a cafe. And he says, I desperately need to see you because I have some very important questions. And he'd come closer to Islam. And we had this discussion, and we talked and then out of the blue, he said, I'm going to become Muslim. And for 10 years we have been talking. And that conversation in the cafe, I spoke to him just a month or two ago. I visited him. 
He said, do you remember that cafe meet, that meeting in the cafe? Of course I remember it. We talked about Jesus. And when I spoke to him, everything meant, made sense. At last, he'd found Jesus. He was brought up as a Christian. He was a Christian preacher. He grew up to be one of the Christian fundamentalist attacks, attackers on Islam. But he said he found, Christ, he found Jesus in a cafe talking to some dude from Nottingham. So it's not just about aqidah, it's about where are we going in our relationship with people. Because if we understand Jesus, other people will understand Jesus. And if we don't, we can't tell people what the truth is. And it's not about saying, this is wrong or this is wrong. What made the difference when, when he took the shahada, he actually made it public about a year later, but I knew at that point he was Muslim. Because he said that when he'd met Muslims, one of the things he hated about them was that they didn't love Jesus. They talked about loving Jesus, but they didn't love Jesus. They could tell the story of Jesus, and they could say, Jesus is the prophet of Islam. And that was an easy slogan to say. But he felt that they didn't love Jesus until he met me. And we talked about Jesus. I didn't talk about, this is how, we, I said, this is what it says in the Quran. This is what it says, and interesting with the brother. So what's your name, brother? Just tell me about the Kina. Talat. Talha. So Talha just says about Aqidah. And one of the things is I quoted some of the scholars of our Aqidah, in particular among the Ash'ari scholars. And he was shocked that the Muslims really did love the Prophet, love the prophet Isa, Jesus. He felt it was just lip service from Muslims. Yeah, we, Jesus, Prophet of Islam. It's an easy slogan. You know, you, there's loads of Islam channel videos about it. But the reality is, do you, did, they re, did they really love Jesus like I did? And at, at last he found somebody that did love Jesus and he was orthodox in his Islam. So orthodox, he would quote Abu, uh, Abu Hassan, uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, al the great Aqilah scholar. So knowing who Jesus is is very important to where we are going as people. Every single one of us. You've all got your own stories. And if you haven't got your stories yet, you will have them. Don't worry. The second story going back is the story of Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. The Muslims were under great pressure in Mecca. The people were against. They were torturing. They were harming the Muslims. And the Muslims needed to run. They needed to find refuge. The Prophet Sallallahu gave them permission to leave. Where did they go? Ethiopia. Is that right? You're thinking Medina. That came later, but the, the sheikh over there is correct. He said Al-Habasha, Ethiopia. And why did they go to Ethiopia? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a good king there. A Christian king. So they went. And there was, you have to remember, there was no prayer. Salah had not been established yet. The rules of Islam hadn't been established. There was no such thing as Aqidah in those days. They went, and then the, Islam was still in its embryonic stage, so to speak. So Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib is important. Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the person who looked the most like the Prophet Of all human beings, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the elder brother of Sayyidina Ali karamallahu wajha, and they, the companion said he was the one who looked physically the most like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Hamda, that's kind of important in one part of the story. So he says, "What should I do if this Christian king asks me about Jesus?" And he said, "Read this. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kaf." Then he goes, and then he comes, and come when you come to this point. Up to this point. So you tell him, read these. So he says, okay, I'll read those. If ever I need to, I'll read those verses. Surah al Maryam. Surah al Maryam. So off he goes. And of course, the, the Quraysh chase after him after them and they attack them 
The way they attack them is very clever. They go to the negus, the king, and they say, there are some terrorists. They don't use that word. They say people who have caused fitna in our community. They fled, and we want them back because they're bad people. And the Satan and uh, Nagashi, he says, no, we don't do things like that. They came to their, our, ho our guests. We don't just chase people out. They came here, they're welcome here. <sighs> How are we going to get them back? So they come back the next day. He says, you know those people that we talked to you about? Not only do they cause trouble, they, call, they say, your God, your God is a slave. What? Yeah, they said that Jesus is a slave. Ah. Uh, so they called the leader and the man walked in. And who was the man that walked in? Ja'far ibn Abi Talib with his amama, with his turban. And who does he look the most like? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He walks in with this beauty and majesty. And they ask him, so what do you say of our Lord Jesus and he reads this and he comes to the point where he talks about the birth of Jesus in this surah and the story of it is that the baby Jesus speaks while he's in the, cra in the cradle, cradle for asharat ilay so the people so Sayyidatina Maryam points to the baby for asharat ilay and then the surah con and the how can we speak to a baby who is in his cradle? So the people came. So he's telling this story. And then the baby speaks. I am the slave of Allah. I was given the book. And he made me a prophet. And he made me blessed. Wherever I was, salamu alayya yawma walidtu. There will be peace upon me on the day I was born. Wa yawma amutu, and the day on which I died. Wa yawma ub'athu hayya, and the day on which I will be resurrected. Thalika isa ibn Maryam. And then you can imagine this beautiful man standing in front of the negus, the king. And he's reading this. Thalika isa ibn Maryam. Qawlu al-haqq alladhi fihi yamtarun. What does the negus do? He cries. And he gets his stick. And the people look at him and they think, oh, now he's going to hit him. And he takes his stick and he puts it in the sand. Shh. Between me and you is this line. Go. And he sends the two people away. And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib stayed until the Prophet called him to al Madinah many years later. So that story is the story of how the story of Isa changed the hearts of the leader. And likewise, the story of Jesus changed the hearts of the leader of the fascists nearly, to, nearly 1400 years later. So this story is not just, oh, this is a story. I know Ismail has come to hear stories. But this is more than just a story. This is about who we are here in Manchester. It's about where we're going as a community. It's about how we relate to people. It's about the likes of Abdullah Quilliam. Abdullah Quilliam didn't just make things, he didn't, it wasn't, people didn't just become Muslim because he stood on the corner or he had a TV channel. He was a great, great scholar. But he was one of the most wise people that lived at that time. There's a story of somebody called Fatima Cates. Abdullah Quilliam used to give talks at what was the early uh, Alcoholics Anonymous for people that wanted to get... There was a movement to try and get alcohol out of society. And in Liverpool, today and 100 years ago, alcohol was a problem. Abdullah Quilliam used to give talks, regular talks, on the Arab teetotaler. His, one of his talks was called the Arab teetotaler. What does teetotaler mean? Somebody that doesn't drink wine. And who's the, Arab, the great Arab teetotaler? 
is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he'd go to these these talks and deliver talks about the great Arab teetotaler, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and talk about a religion which bans alcohol because it believes that you should have a pure relationship with your God. So this is about how Islam functions just down the road. Just down the road from down the M62, which wasn't in existence in those days, down in Liverpool. All right, enough about that. I've got some questions for you because I'm tired. Sorry, I've been teaching all day, driving all over the place. Question. Was Jesus a Christian? If you think the answer is yes, put your hand up. Nobody. Huh? What do you say over there? Was Jesus Christian? Not sure. He was Muslim. So, you mean he prayed five times a day and went to Shah Jalal Mosque? <laughs> no, what do we mean he was Muslim? What does that mean? I mean, I, I know what you're saying, but what do you mean? Same aqidah as we've been. Yeah, good. So, in terms of aqidah, it's a very aqidah mosque, isn't it? Huh? That's three times I've heard the word aqidah. They come and ask me to tell some stories and I end up in an aqidah lesson. Very good. He was our prophet. That's what we're saying. But that guy that I was talking about, he said, you people don't really love Jesus. You talk about Jesus as the prophet of your prophet. But you don't love him in the way that this man loved him. And when he realized that actually you should love him like that, and the Quran shows, encourages, he became Muslim. But he wasn't Christian. And he wasn't Muslim in the sense of he's ours from this generation. He is in one sense because he's mentioned in our book. But he was from the children of Israel. And he was the last great Israelite prophet. Now, I, three things have come up there. He was an Israelite. And I asked the question, was he, was he a Christian? And the answer was no. But the Christians might disagree with you. If I asked that question in almost any church, anywhere in the world, and asked, was Jesus a Christian? Almost everybody will say yes. Because he's, that's what Christianity is. So for them, Christianity is defined by the relationship with Jesus. So for us to know who Jesus is, you'll see Jesus is actually the unifying figure, or should be, of the Christians. And the reason I told these two stories is because Negus was a good Christian king. And my friend, Ole Jürgen, was a righteous Com committed Christian who hated Islam and then he stopped hating Islam because he realized that you can love Jesus completely within Islam and you can understand that Jesus who he really is so Jesus becomes the unifying factor for Negus for my friends for everybody so understanding him is really important that's why I started with that question all right you want a lesson on Aqidah? I better get a book. Right. Let me read and pretend to... Did I say... Oops. Let me read and make it look as if I know what I'm talking about. Right. When we say Jesus, the Quran refers to him as the Masih. Mal Masih ibn Marim illa Rasul. That the Masih, or the Messiah, is the son of Maryam, is nothing but a messenger. That's the wording. Think about the beauty of the Arabic language. He's nothing except a prophet. <laughs> he could have just, he's a prophet. But you think about the wording. It's like saying, Charles, he's a nobody other than a king. Is that right? He's the king, isn't he? Have I got it wrong? Was he still, his mom's still around? No, his mom passed away. But the fact that you say, he's nothing but a king. He's nothing but a pro You're telling me how great he is in that statement. We're not putting him down. 
But some people think that's what it does. No, he's just a prophet. He's not. He is a prophet. And that's the most important thing that we should rec- recognize. وَمَالْ مَسِيحِ بْنُ مَانِمْ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَطْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُولُ Messengers came before him and passed before him. What does this refer to? The Bani Israel came prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. From the time of Ya'qub until the time of Sayyidina Isa, there was always a prophet from Bani Israel. One after the other. The Arabs didn't have that. We didn't have that. Nahnu ma'ashul Arab. Us Arabs, we didn't have that. We had Nabi Saleh, Nabi Hud, Nabi Ismail, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they had one after the other. Ummuhu Siddiqah. And then it mentions that his mother was truthful. This is important. Right. <clears throat> so he comes from the, the tribe of, of Bani Israel. He's from the family of Ismail. And he's directly from the family of Imran. Because his mother, Sayyidatina Maryam, is Maryam ibn, ibn, ibn Ibran. Maryam bint Imran, alati ahsanat farjaha. She is the one who was chaste or pure in her sexuality. She was pure. She never went astray. She was in her faraj, literally. She was pure. And this is one of the accusations that the people of Bani Israel made against her because obviously she had what was called the Immaculate Conception. So the first thing you know that she is from the family of Imran. So this is one of the most noble families of um, of, of Bani Israel and likewise her father was also called Imran so she's Maryam bint Imran from the family of Imran now Imran <coughs> has is married when he dies he is married to the sister of the prophet of the time so the two sisters have uh, a married, one is married to Imran and they, she gives birth to Maryam and the other is married to the prophet of the time who is called Zakaria. excellent so Sayyidina Zakaria is the prophet of the time now Imran dies leaving a young baby girl and he takes or the, 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 the the mother takes the, the baby to the ma'bad, to the church, to the, not the church, the place of the worship of the Ben Israel, and asks for her to be looked after. And they say, no, we look after boys. Girls don't come into the mosque. They don't come into our community. They have their roles, but their roles are different. And she can't be brought up in this place of worship. However, Zachariah, who is the prophet of the time, he stands and says, she is special. But because he's the prophet and the leader of the time, and also the uncle, through his sister-in-law, he has some weight. And so she gets this special status in the mosque, in the place of worship. And she grows up literally in the mihrab along with Sayyidina Zakaria. And Sayyidina Zakaria kafalaha, looks after her. And miracles appear at her hands. And one of the miracles is that she would go to the mihrab, the mihrab, the place of prayer, and she would pray. And in the summer, she would go there and when she's finished praying, there would be fruit. But it would be winter fruit. And she would come out with apples in a time when nobody has apples. Oh, where did you get that from? Binendillah, from Allah. And then the summer would come, the winter would come, and she'll have grapes. Where did you get that from? Binendillah. People recognized that this girl 
is no ordinary girl. And Sayyidina Zakaria wanted to look after her and hoped that she would, her status would rise and rise and rise. But in the end, she's still a girl. Prophecy doesn't come to girls. Alhamdulillah, his wife becomes pregnant. And Alhamdulillah, gives birth to a boy who is called Yahya. Yahya, John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist said, Yahya has this possibility of reaching this great status because he's a prophet. Can he reach the status of Sayyidatana Maryam? No. Because Sayyidatana Maryam has a different role. And that role is to give birth to the final prophet of Bani Israel. And to prove, as the brother said, what the true aqidah, the true power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So what happened? Let's go to the, to the, to, to the story that we just mentioned. The story of Sayyidina Ja'far. What was the surah we, we were supposed to read? Surah? Surah Maryam. And in it it says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ إِنْ انْتَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا Mention in the book, Maryam. إِذْ انْتَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا When she took herself away from the community, from the people, into an eastern place. What does it mean, this مَكَانًا When she left her mihrab, she had a special door. She left a door which was specially for her because she's a girl. So she would leave towards the east. And the beauty of leaving towards the east from, this, from the place of prayer was the first thing she saw was Beit al which was the house which was built by her great ancestor. Who? Who built Beit al -Noktis? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam built two houses, two famous buildings. One was Beit al Maqdis, another? The, the Kaaba. The Kaaba. He built the Kaaba and he built. One was built by one of his sons and one was built by the other of his sons. Who were the two sons? Ismail and, Is and Ishaq. And Ishaq's son was called Yaqub who is also called Israel. Yaqub and Israel is the same person. And of Israel, he had 12 children, which are known as the 12 tribes of Israel. So when we tell this story, this is the story of Bani Israel, which is why Jesus is such an important unifying factor. Because if, we, if everybody knew him, we'd all be following the true Akidah, as the brother said over there. But for some reason, people's feelings towards Jesus stop them from having the true belief, including my friend. Anyway, so she would come. So she took a, a, a way of putting a barrier between them. And we sent to her our spirit. The spirit, when we hear in the Quran, the word ruh in almost every verse, apart from one, refers to Sayyidina Jibreel. So it says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشْرًا سَوِيَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشْرًا سَوِيَا And he took the form of a perfect human being. So when she came out from the mosque, towards Beit al -Maktis. Why did she leave? The commentators say two things. One was to have peace in herself. She'd been in worship and now she wanted to enjoy, take a breather, raha. She wanted raha and she found the ruh, al-ameen. And this man appeared, qalat inni a'udhu bir rahman minka in kunta taqiyya. She says, ah, I seek refuge in the Rahman if you are not somebody good. 
So she's not sure why this man is there. قالت إني عنذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقي قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا I have come to give you to bestow upon you لأهب لك غلاما زكيا to give to you um, a perfect child قال it she said قال it how can I give birth to a child when no man has ever touched me? And I'm not one of those people that, you know, I'm not married. So how can I have child? What did the, the, the ruh say? What did this man? That's how it is. That's it. That's how it is. You're going to have a child. And this is what we're saying about the Aqidah. The Aqidah, the story of Jesus, is not the story just of Jesus. It's about how we relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can do whatever He wishes. He can do anything. It's easy for Him. And so that we can make this child an ayah. A sign, a sign by which a couple of thousand years later there's going to be all these people in a mosque in Manchester just around the corner from Wilmslow Road where they're not going to be eating kebabs. They're going to be sitting in the mosque talking about why are we here? What is this sign? What is Jesus all about? That's why this happened. وَلِنَجْعَلُهُ آيَةَ لِلنَّاسِ وَرَحْمَةً مِنَّهِ And a special mercy from us. وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْتِيَ And this is already decided. How, what does it mean by him being a mercy? We said he's from Bani Israel. What had happened was that Bani Israel had become so focused on the law. They'd become so focused on the law that they'd missed the spirit of the law. And I'll give you an example. Sayyidina Isa didn't change the law. He breathed into it the spirit of the law. One of the best examples is that there was a lady who was accused of adultery. And they said that she should be stoned to death. What did Jesus say? Do you know? He who has never committed a sin should cast the first stone. So whoever of you is perfect, pick up the stone and stone her. He didn't say that she's right. He said that you've missed the spirit of the law. So what he did, he breathed into the law of Bani Israel, the essence and the spirit of the law. He introduced a concept of love which had been lost which is why people get torn about their love for Jesus. Because he was the embodiment of, of love. But because he became the embodiment of love, some people left the law. And that's something that's relevant to us as Muslims. Because there are some people who out of love think that everything is acceptable. And there are those people who have lost the our concept of love there was a companion and <clears throat> his face turned yellow. He became ill. His name was Sayyidina Thoban. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Are you ill? What's wrong with you? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I missed you. <laughs> he missed him. He was just in the other room. Sayyidina Thoban lived in the mosque. And the Prophet ﷺ lived in his house, which was attached to the mosque. And he hadn't seen him for a while. And he'd turned ill out of this yearning for the Prophet ﷺ. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the command to, 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 to obey the Prophet. ﷺ. And the Prophet smiled and he says, Al-mar'u ma'a man ahab. 
The person in you will be the one, with the one you love. And the companion said on that day, that was the happiest day they had ever experienced. Because love was recognized as the role of love in the relationship with the Prophet was, was, was known. So in some ways, the predecessor to this was Sayyidina Isa. He was rahmatan minna, a mercy from us. وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْتِيًا فَحَمَلَتْهُ فَانْتَبَذَتْ بِهِ مَقَانًا قَدِيًّا So she... Then the ruh, what is the ruh? The ruh is the spirit. Now every single one of us was visited in our mother's womb. Hmm? It's true. There's a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ يَجْمَعَ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً يَوْمًا نُطْفَةً ثُمَّ أَلَقَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ ثُمَّ مُدْخَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكَ That every single one of you was born, was created for 40 days as a, uh, a seed and then became a blood clot for 40 days and then became a morsel of flesh for 40 days and then an angel was sent to your mother to breathe you, the spirit of you, are into your mother. And that's why you have an element of this special quality of the ruh. However, this ruh that's referred to in this is, is unique. This ruh is Sayyidina Jibril, who appears to Sayyidina, Sayyidina Maryam, and then, according to different tafsirs, he breathes the spirit directly into Maryam with no other, other means. And she becomes pregnant. Some say he breathed into her sleeve. Some say he breathed straight into her mouth. Whatever, we, whatever the tafsir is, it doesn't really matter. The reality was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَكَانَ amra maqtiya. The ruh entered into her and she became pregnant. She carried this baby. The word got out. And you know, who, who, who was Maria, Maria married to? Mary. In the story that we, that we learn in school. The famous story, they go off to Bethlehem on a donkey. With who? Who is it? Yeah. Joseph. Yusuf and Najjar. Now the reality was that there was a man called Yusuf and Najjar. And he had heard about the most righteous woman that existed. And that righteous woman was Sayyidat Tana Maryam. And he went, when he heard that people were starting to talk about her because that she, she was pregnant. He couldn't fathom what was going on. Everybody says she's the most perfect woman, but how can she not be? Pre how can she be pregnant and not married? So he went and approached her to marry her because there must be something going on. And he asked what happened, and she explained that the ruh had come. And he says, but how? And she says, This is how Allah had planned it. And at this, he agrees to, he, he marries or approaches her. So Yusuf was part of the story. But his role was not the same as it appears in the Nativity story. He has an almost even greater story. His role was to recognize this beautiful human being and her special status and he loves her and he marries her for that reason and he then is the, brings up this child so his role is not just some guy on a donkey carrying I mean, when I hear that stuff I'm thinking if you only knew the truth then you would really recognize how great this story is so alhamdulillah she, she um, she's told after this, the angel comes back and he knows now that they're going to be accusing her because they're already accusing her. So he, she asks, what should I do? So he says, you should say, inni nadhartu li rahmani sawman. That when anybody comes, la ukelima, that I will not speak illa ramzan. I will only indicate by, stop by lines, ramzan. I'm not going to speak. When people attack me, I'm just going to um, deal with it quietly. Just, okay, Allah will answer. 
This is Allah's business. This ain't my business. Do you know how many kids spoke in the, in the cradle? Come on, boys, give me a guess. Jesus, one. You think only one? Yeah. It's a good guess, but wrong. <laughs> good guess, but wrong. Any advance on one? Two. Wrong. Five. There is a hadith which says five, but it's not in Bukhari or Muslim, so I'm not going to qu quote it. There's a hadith which says, لا, لا There were only three. Can I sidetrack into the other two stories? I promise it won't be long. They're important, especially today. How many people have been insulted? Okay, let's make it easier. Is there anybody who's never been insulted? Is there anybody who's never had their culture, their religion attacked? You know, we have a World Cup. Huh? And when Pele won the World Cup in 1972, 1970, sorry, he wore a sombrero. It was Mexico. When the Australian Olympics took place, everybody had a koala bear given. And when it was in Qatar, Astaghfirullah, those Muslims, what did they make them wear? The cloak of the, queen, of the king. And somehow this gets blown into some attack on Islam. There were no arrests because there was no alcohol. Oh, what a terrible, what a terrible World Cup. At every level, Islam and Muslims are being undermined and attacked. So what should we do? Get onto Facebook and start attacking Gary Lineker? Huh? No. Listen to these three stories. Three times babies spoke, according to this hadith. And in other, you're right, five. In another one, it's eight. I'm going to tell you three. The first one is the one we're talking now, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Isa. The second one was Yusuf. Yep, he didn't speak. But when he was attacked, when he was, an accusation was made against him. What accusation? That he was... A woman approached him, and this woman wasn't any old woman. She was the wife of the Aziz, the boss, the minister, the chief. She privately, in her private quarters, with nobody there, no adults were anywhere nearby, she approached him because she liked him, because he was beautiful, and she wanted to have a relationship with him. And he did, he, it's not summer, he didn't. So she grabbed him. And she tore his shirt. And then her husband walked in. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh and she said, he looks, what's going on here? Slave boy? My wife? Torn shirt? Something going on here. And obviously he's angry. And she says, no, he tried, he approached me and it, it, I was fighting him off. And of course, it, I didn't do anything. It's the exact opposite. What does Allah say? There was a witness. There were no adults. There was a baby. And the baby says, If it's torn from the front, then she's telling the truth. Yeah, he's telling the truth and she's lying. But if it's torn from the back, then he's telling the truth. And of course it was torn from the back. He ran away and she grabbed him. So who was the one, who was the witness? Was a baby. And why was he bearing witness? Because a righteous person was being attacked. The third story is the story of Juraj. Anybody know the story of Juraj? Juraj was a man from Bani Israel who was a good man and he spent his life in worship and he worshipped and he worshipped and he worshipped and he worshipped and he used to pray so much that he just cut himself off to his suma it's like his prayer place and he's praying and he's praying and his mum came one day and he says Juraj and he's in his prayer he's thinking carry on praying or listen to mum no Allah and she leaves 
He comes back, she comes back the next day. Same thing. Dual age! He doesn't answer. And the third day, but this time she's now angry. And she gets angry. He doesn't even listen to me. And she, she says, may you not die except when you see the face of the Zania. Like, like, what kind of curse is that? So she curses him. And her dua is answered. There's this woman comes afterwards and she wants to have a relationship with him. And he says, no, 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 no. And she pushes him out. She sends her away. And she gets angry because she doesn't want, she doesn't, she feels rejected. So what's she, I'm going to get her own back on her. She becomes pregnant with a man. But what she does is she blames him. And she tells everybody, it was Jurej. And they go and they destroy his place of worship. And they throw him out of the city. He doesn't care. Because he knows the truth. And then he comes back after the baby's born. And he sees the house where the baby is. And he hears the baby in the house. And he calls all the people. And he says, we should go and ask the baby. He makes two rakats of salah. They go to the baby. In front of everybody, he says to the baby, Man Abuk, who's your father? And the baby says, Fulan ibn Fulan, Arai. So and so, so and so, the herdsman. The baby spoke. The three stories, what's the significance of the three stories and how does it relate to Gary Lineker? Oh, to, to people today. Sometimes, if you know the truth, you don't need to fight about it. Kul, al haq was a haq al batil. Inna al batil kan as a Say the truth will come and falsehood will perish. For indeed, falsehood perishes by its very nature. No one is going to remember those idiots who write on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's all going to disappear. But the truth will always be there. So don't worry if you start to get attacked. The lesson, one of the lessons is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you miracles, so to speak, by your silence, when you don't need to speak. You don't need to fight about everything. Just some things is not worth fighting about. Let him eat his crisps. Okay? Yeah? Let him live his life. Let him get on with what he's doing. And we don't worry about it. Anyway. فَحَمَّلَتُهُ فَانْتَبَذَتْ بِهِ مَكَانًا قَصِيَّةً فَجَاءَ الْمَخَاضِ إِلَى جِزِئِ النَّخْلَةً So continue with the story that Sayyidina is وَقَالَتْ يَا لَيْتَنِ مِتُّ قَبْلَ هَذَا وَكُنْتُ نَسِيَ مَنْسِيَ She gets to a point where she decides I'm going to just leave everybody and I'm going to carry this baby and give birth somewhere. So she leaves and she gets to a point where the pains really take over. قَالَتْ يَا لَيْتَنِ مِتُّ قَبْلَ هَذَا I wish that I was not even born. That's how painful it is. And then she hears a voice from beneath. Now, people understand this differently. al qurtubi says that what he heard, what she heard was actually Jesus speaking. The baby says, don't worry, mommy. It's going to be all right. Others say it was at the bottom of the valley. Sayyidina Jibril came back and says, don't worry. Whatever happened, we know that Allah said, don't worry. Whichever means it was. Underneath there is a flowing river. Now that can mean two different things. Meaning this baby is a flowing river or actually at the bottom of the hill there's a flowing river. Both of these beautiful images are true because what she was going to give birth to was going to be complete light, was going to be complete nur, was going to be complete rahmah, was going to be the kalimat Allah was going to be a word from Allah. So, so she turned to a tree and she grabbed the bottom of the tree and she shook this tree. Why? Because of the pains. To socket alayhi rutban janiya. And from the tree, a big juicy date. Rutb means juicy date, not just date, a juicy date fell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided her with rizq throughout her life. In the winter, summer fruit. And now at this point, he gives her this date. 
فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنَا Now what you should do is eat, drink and wash yourself. This river was there specifically for you. فَآتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُوا And after she gave birth, her people came. تَحْمِلُوا تَحْمِلُوا means making accusations. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. But the same stories there, they come to undermine her, to attack her. What was she supposed to do? Get up and argue? She was told specifically to indicate inni nadhartu li rahmani sawman fa'asharat ilay So she pointed to the baby. فَقَالَ كَيْفَ نُكَلِمَ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ الصَّبِيَّةِ How are we supposed to talk to a baby? And then قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدَ اللَّهِ then the baby says, I am the slave of Allah. So, a lesson, sufficient? Huh? The belief is that he is the slave of Allah. Qala inni ab. The first words that come out of his mouth, I am not God, I am the slave of God. Qala inni abdullah, atani al kitab, and I was given the book. He's a baby, he's not a prophet yet. But he says in the past tense, I was given the book. I mean, he's already destined to be a prophet. Salamu alayhi yawmu walidtu. There will be peace on me on the day that I was born. So he marks this event of his coming into the world. So I'm not saying you should celebrate Christmas because he wasn't born on the 25th. But you should celebrate his existence. By remembering him and f- contemplating the story. And when you know the story, it's something we should celebrate. That is Isa, the son of Maryam. The word about which they want to dispute with you. So, inshallah, I think I was asked to tell the story of Jesus from the Quran. And I think. That's the story I'm telling. Does anybody have any questions? Preferably not about football. Sorry. Marhaba, please. Sir, could you speak? Very good, very, very good question. If you look at all the historic data around the month in which he was born, in terms of fruit, and most most data suggests he was born at this time, in terms of year 2022. However, the month was probably around September. And even the birth of Jesus depends on which which church you follow, because the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church say it was in January. And this date, the 25th of February, thank you. I get confused, you know, I get confused about everything, but in particular about dates. 25th of December. The reason why this date was adopted is when the Pauline church entered into Greece, the 25th of December was already marked as being a date after the, the, actually originally it was the first Sunday after the winter solstice. So 22nd is the is the shortest day of the year in the northern hemisphere. And the first Sunday after that was marked as the date on which you celebrate the end of winter or the beginning of a new life. And the Christians originally adopted that the first Sunday after the 22nd. And then it got fixed to the 25th. Only by some of the church. Others said it would be in January. So that's a good question. No, I like that. Any other questions? Please. What, what is the Messiah? The Messiah, excellent. The Messiah is the word that is used. The Messiah in the, in the Christian understanding is the final um, messenger who comes back. But the word Messiah actually means the one who's been anointed, has been given the special role. And anointing or, or, or doing this is, is actually what Sayyidina Yahya does to people. So he anoints people. Now Sayyidina Yahya later 
takes Jesus and he throws him into the places him into the River Jordan. And this is a significant thing in the history of, of Christianity because what happens is the placing of John the Baptist of Jesus into the River Jordan is the basis for what we call baptism. So he becomes John the Baptist because what he does, he chooses specific people to give them what we would say in Arabic, the ghusl, the, the purification of their state. Now, can I tell another story? Uh, okay, I have a friend, um, or I had a friend, this is a very, very long time ago. Um, I was about 20 and he was about 16, 15 or 16 years old. So he's a few years younger than me. And um, he was a Rastafarian. And so, like many Rastafarians, used to um, smoke substances which are not legal. Um, and as a result of that, his mind was not always um, focused. Uh, so he was basically stoned most of the time. And he came to my house on a regular basis as a child. And, then, and one day he came to my house and we were just talking. And I, he's a great guy. So we got talking. And one day I said to him, you know why we pray the way we do? He goes, no, man. Why you pray that way, man? I says, we put our head on the floor because it's a way to really know who God is. Because we spend all our time like this. Man, I'm important. And then you put your head on the floor and you realize you ain't important. God's important. And he says, yeah, man. That's cool. The following week, he came to see me. He used to come and see me every Sunday. The following week, he seemed different. Less stoned. Or a different kind of stoned. He wasn't quite himself. And I says, what's the matter with you? He says, you know, I've been spending all my nights head on the floor. Give me more, man. He wanted more of this Islam business. He wanted, he didn't know anything. I didn't talk to him about Aqidah. There was no Akira discussion. The guy was too stoned for Akira. But what he did know was that we put our heads on the floor and he did it and he felt God. He knew God was there. He just wanted and he found it. The reason why he took all of those bad things was because he didn't know what was going on and he wanted to find God and he thought he could find God by smoking um, grass. So he, and he didn't. He found God by putting his head on the floor. And the first thing he says, give me more, man. I need more. I'm thinking, what am I supposed to say to him now? Should I teach him the Akhida? What should I do? I says, look, just go and have a shower. I want you to go upstairs and I want you to have a full wash. And when you get into that shower, I want you to just have in your mind that everything is washing you clean. And he did. And he came down and he looked clean. Not that he looked dirty before, but there was something that happened with that wash. And then he took his shahada. Alhamdulillah. Can I tell another story? Huh? All right. There's no cannabis in this one, but there's a lot of alcohol. Sorry. Astaghfirullah. There was a girl, and she wasn't a good girl. I mean, she did naughty things. And among the naughty things, she went to places where they drink lots of bad things. So she went to this place where they drink lots of bad things and she met a guy that also drinks lots of bad things. And they decided that they'd go to a hotel together to do bad things in this hotel. So they went into this hotel to do their bad things and he went into the bathroom because he needed a pee. And she fell asleep. And she had a dream. And when he came out to do bad things, she jumped up and ran away. And she went home. And she jumped into the bath. And then she washed and she washed. She got out of the bath and went to sleep. And then she couldn't get clean, so she had another shower. I think most psychologists would say OCD. But she did it over and over and over again, all the night, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And after three days of just being freaked out, she went to work. And there was a girl that said to her, Oh, I didn't see you at work for the last few days. Where have you been? She said, I had this really strange dream. I was, went to somewhere to do bad things and I fell asleep and I saw on the side of my desk, on the side of the cabinet, was a book and this book had light coming out of it and it freaked me out and I just had to go home and wash and I washed, I couldn't get clean, I washed again I, and the girl said, oh don't be silly, that was just a Quran. 
And she walked off. And they're like thinking, what's a Quran? So she Googled Quran. Oh, Book of the Muslims. So she got herself a Quran in Norwegian. She was Norwegian. She read this Quran and became Muslim. Ajib. What does Allah say? Inna Allah yuhibb tawabin wa yuhibb mutatahirin. Allah loves those who turn back to Him and they love those who want to wash themselves. So this idea of the Messiah is the one who purifies. And we don't need to do that because we have the process of what we call the ghusl. We wash. And we have the process of what we call wudu. To approach Allah. So we don't kind of need the special status of the Messiah. Sorry. You ask a question, I end up telling a story. Sorry about that. Please. Did Jesus No. وَمَا قَتَلَهُ وَمَا صَلَبُهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّيَ لَهُمْ No, he wasn't killed and he, didn't, he wasn't crucified. It just appeared like that. That's how the Quran describes it. What does that mean? There was a man who looked very like, much like him, who was from the same tribe, whose name was Judas Iscariot. And Judas had betrayed Jesus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken Jesus and protected him. And taken Judas Iscariot and placed him on the, on the cross. And people looked and said, is this Jesus or is this Judas? Is this Jesus or Judas? But they didn't kill him. And they didn't crucify him. It wasn't him. But it appeared that way. Marhaba. Two questions. What, when was he born? According to most historians. And the, the important thing here is that it's not the date that's important, but the, the concept, what happened. And so, likewise with the, the birth of the Prophet wasallam, the date's significant, but what's more significant than that is his birth. Which is why those people who mark the birth of the Prophet including the Prophet himself, because when he was asked, why do we fast on Mondays? He says, it's the day on which I was born. So he marked the day, but what was more important was that, that we mark the coming of the Prophet which is why Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, when he was asked, is it bid'ah to mark the birth of the Prophet he says, yes, unless you mark it every day. If you just make it once a year, khalas, this is wrong. If you make it every day except that day, khalas, that's better. So if you do it 359 days of the 360, but not the 12th of Rabi'ul, you're following the Sunnah. But if you mark one day, which is, the, the, which is why the date itself isn't important, and most scholars say that it was sometime in, in September, around that year, which is the year that was marked. Marhaba. When did Isa die? He didn't die. He, he was taken up. He, when he was taken up, he was taken up at the age of 33 years old. He was taken up at the age of 33 and he will return. And when he returns, he will call people to the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, I just want to say, um, obviously, a lot of people nowadays do not follow, they do not celebrate Christmas as a religious festival. This is a time where families and you know, friends will get together and give gifts to each other. So, if that's the case, then why can't people just celebrate Christmas? Oh, very good question. He says that some people get together to give gifts and. Um, huh? And they have the Christmas. Day. And they, they, get, they gather together, they have a dinner together. Why don't they just celebrate Christmas? Depends what you mean by the word celebrate. Because celebrate is quite kind of key to that sentence, to that question. What are we doing? Celebrating. What does celebrate mean? And I'm not quite sure. Can you help me? Because you asked the question. So what do you mean by celebrate? A lot of times uh, people tend to do it because it's, everyone's off work. So I think celebrating Christmas by getting together Maybe it's a way of uh, reflecting the year and how the year... Okay. So, so... I think it's maybe... I mean, thinking about it now, it's individual, it's going to get all the attention like it. 
Right, the Prophet says, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالَ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are only actions by intention. So if by chance you happen to eat a turkey sandwich on the 25th of December, are you celebrating Christmas? No. If it happened by accident, then it's not intended. It's not an action. You didn't eat, so to speak, a turkey sandwich as an act of worship. You just happened to eat a turkey sandwich because that's the only thing that was left. Okay, so what does it mean to celebrate? It means to, has to have an intention. Now, many people don't have holidays at the same time other than Christmas. So some shops don't close except a couple of days at Christmas. So for some people, the only time that family can meet will be on the 25th of December. For other people, they will actually meet specifically on the 25th. For some people, they will, uh, they will meet specifically on the 25th. And I'll give you an example. I had a friend, may Allah bless, bless him and increase him, a guy called Scott. And as you can guess, he was Scottish. So Scott became Muslim. And when he became Muslim, he became a very strict Muslim. And then he met me. Um, and then he became a less strict Muslim, apparently. Well, anyway, his beard got shorter after he met me. Um, and he's got tidier as well, alhamdulillah. And he seemed much more relaxed. I mean, he was a great guy even when he was strict. I'm not saying that, I'm just teasing. He, he was a great guy. But he was very, very careful about his deen. And there was a lot of things that happened in his, in his past to do with his family, which meant his family had a, he had a difficult relationship with his family. And then some things happened. And a few, many years later, he asked me, should I meet my family on the 25th of December? And it's a very clear question. He's gone on a journey. And I'm, part, I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm proud to be, he, I love him very much, and I'm proud to be part of his journey. Now he's asking me, sort of as a sheikh and a friend and a teacher, should I meet? And I said yes. But you need to be careful of the environment that you are establishing in meeting. And if you can protect all of your values, then you should meet them. But if you can't, then you need to be comfortable in where you're meeting them. So alhamdulillah, he made a suggestion, this particular restaurant, which happened to be open on the motorway and happened to sell halal food and doesn't sell alcohol. And as a compromise, this was actually the best place for people to meet. So he organized the Christmas dinner, so to speak, as a Muslim. Did he celebrate Christmas? Now, the word celebrate, I'm not quite sure what it meant. I know what his intention was. And I know that as a consequence of that, his family became closer. And the following Eid, he invited a couple of his family to come and celebrate Eid. And they were really reluctant. So they came to the Eid party, which was a new Muslim Eid party. And these two guys are looking really, really miserable. And they really don't want to be there. They don't want to celebrate Eid. One of them's got a Thin Lizzy t-shirt on. Yeah, Thin Lizzy's a band. Um, and apparently the sheikh walks in. Um, and he sits there and he sees the guy with the Thin Lizzy t-shirt on looking really miserable. And he goes up and he says, which was the best guitarist from Thin Lizzy? Was it Scott Gorman or was it um, um, Eric Bell? And the guy looks at him and thinks... Who are you? Why are you coming to this Eid party? And why are you asking about guitarists? Scott Gorman, of course, you idiot. <laughs> and he says, Scott Gorman. And then the sheikh apparently turns around and he says, actually, Eric Bell was much better. And he explains why he thinks Eric Bell. And this, no, 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 they start discussing music. And this, the three start to get all live. Yeah, that was... And they, the, the, two, the two brothers start to... Or the brother and his uncle start to... Yeah, yeah. He says, you know, I really wish I could stay for this Eid party, but I've got to go. And the sheikh disappeared. But they didn't know it was a sheikh, they just thought it was a rocker. And then the guy walks over and he says, oh, you're looking quite happy now, what happened? He says, I don't know, some dude just walked in and started talking about music. Uh, he says, oh, you mean the sheikh was here? What? Sheikh? What? He says, yeah, that's the guy I wanted you to meet. All oh, right. It was pretty cool. 
when can I meet him again? And then they arranged for the sheikh and him and the brothers to meet after Eid. Now, from that Christmas do, lots of good things happened. Lots of good things happened. So again, it's to do with the intention. Of, did he celebrate Christmas or did he bring his family together? So I don't believe he celebrated Christmas. I think he brought his family together. There are other people who want to keep family ties because they know that their family have cut them off and Christmas is an important time for them. And for them, they may go just to keep their family ties. Are they celebrating Christmas or are they keeping family ties? Because if they're keeping family ties, it's compulsory. Allah has commanded them to. So therefore, them going to that, according to their intention, is compulsory. So it's a difficult question you're asking. And you need to be a bit more specific, so to speak. There's a, a mosque on the Wirral who was giving Christmas presents to local orphans. Were they celebrating Christmas? I'm asking. They got a lot of criticism. Even the mosque is celebrating Christmas with a Santa Claus giving presents. Any comments? To add to the brother's question. Were they celebrating Christmas? And by the way, I'm asking because I don't know. Yeah, please help me. Perhaps. Personally, um, I'm not sure I would have done it in that way. But I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not willing to criticize them because they gave <coughs> presents to local poor kids. And I know what their intention was, was to give charity, to support people, and also to make people know that they are there when, you, when they need them. If you need something, come to the mosque. That's what their message was. I think, for example, calling people to eat a meal, with the intention of calling people to eat a meal. In Glasgow, this is a family day. The 25th is a family day, and they have a big fair. I don't know if that would be considered celebrating, but it's a day when the kids get together. And it kind of compensates for what alternatives there are, because there are lots of not-so-healthy alternatives on the 25th of December. Please. Please. That's a celebration, and we all obviously have to, we eat all every day, and then on, like you say, on Christmas Day, everyone gets together, and not everyone, but people, some people have meals and stuff, but other people have gone a bit further as a Christmas tree or some sort of decoration. Okay, now we're getting into specifics, and I like this, because there are certain things which are considered to be worship, and those things are haram. You cannot worship in any form which is not within the Sharia. So if you adopt an act of worship which is from outside of Sharia, it will be rejected. Now here, when you talk about the decorations, there are certain things which were worshipped before Christianity. And one of them was the evergreen tree. Because the evergreen tree, when everything else is, is, is dying, the evergreen tree stays alive. So the deciduous trees they lose their leaves. But the evergreen tree doesn't. And therefore the evergreen tree was seen as an, as an object of worship before Christianity. It was then adopted into Christianity as the Christmas tree. Now if you know the roots of this, having a Christmas tree, in my understanding, would be related to that, that religious root. Now if you just adopt a, a, a Christmas tree not knowing that, Perhaps Allah is, is pardoning and kind and forgiving. However, once you know that, would you really have a Christmas tree? And that's where the question of celebrating. Now that mosque in the Wirral, in the Merseyside, they gave presents. Now when it gets to a point, did they put the presents under a Christmas tree? Because that would now to me be, well, actually now we're, not, we're going into an area which is an act of worship. It's related to a previous worship. Did they sing carols? Or did they just sing songs by George Michael? You know? Because those carols have very specific words of worship. So here, when it gets to the point of worship, now we're entering into the, clearly into the realm of what is 
potentially, probably haram. And therefore, you just have to stay away from anything which is related to the worship related to Christmas. And that's why he was... And the, uh, the other thing, which is not worship, which is just dangerous, is alcohol. And the reason why I was very particular about my friend to be careful about the environment is because in Scotland, alcohol is a big problem. Alcohol is a really big problem. And nobody celebrates anything without alcohol. So everything is alcohol related. Now, I don't go to Christmas parties. Not because I don't, I'm a, uh, I'm, I don't like Christmas. I just don't like alcohol. And I can't get to a position in my job, except there was a point where I was the manager. And I just said, if you want a Christmas party, it's in working hours, there will be no alcohol. I'm the boss. You want a party? This is how it's going to be. No, we don't really want a party because you can't have a party without alcohol, but we'll go for a meal and give some presents. Okay. When I left that post, I went to somewhere else, I couldn't control the environment. So I never involved in Christmas. Not because I was against my Christian friends, it's just I didn't want to be involved where alcohol was involved. So your choices have to be around too. Chris, the, the worship and the environment that you're going into. So they're the kind of two key, key areas about what's haram and what's halal.